But God has a message for us today, and we're going to piggyback off of what's taking place right now as we honor um, the men and women who not only have given of their life so we could be here this morning to worship with this freedom, but also as we have honored those that have served and continue to serve, protecting the very freedom that we have. Hope of the nations. Let me ask you this question. As this slide comes up, let me ask you, uh, on the coins and on our dollar bills, it says, in God we trust. So my question is, do we still trust in God in this country? What do you think? What are some thoughts there? Do we still trust in God? How many of you would say yes? How many of you say, I'm not really sure? How many of you say, I'm not going to play this game right now? Well, you have to play. You see, America has an incredible heritage. In fact, I think of that motto, In God We Trust. Just this past year, uh, 2015, uh, the Lord allowed us the blessing of, uh, of purchasing In God We Trust decals to put them on all of the Union County patrol cars. Very thankful that Sheriff Mason allowed us to do that. In fact, uh, as you notice throughout the paper as he was running for office, he had, a, he had this little arrow that kept pointing that, that uh, on the cars. And I thought, that's kind of cool. We know that we were a part of, of not the election, but we were a part of getting in God we trust out there. I'm not about the election. I'm about getting God out. Amen. Not God out of here, but God out there so people will know who he is. We also had the blessing of purchasing those decals. No one in Fannin County would do it. So they came to us, Sheriff Kirby, and says, Hey, listen, would your church be interested and willing to purchase In God We Trust for the patrol cars in Fannin County? I said, consider it done, and we did. Amen. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll do that for any county. I don't care how big or small, because God will provide for us to be able to do that and get to that. And I thought to myself, as this was happening across America, as sheriff's offices here in both Georgia and Florida and Texas and Louisiana and Alabama, and all of them began to spread the gospel, as I think of it, on the patrol car, many folks said that there needed to be a separation of church and state. And I thought to myself, my goodness, in God we trust is the national motto. You know? And, and it's on every dollar bill and coin. So here was my thought. As those were complaining, I thought to myself, well, goodness, everything that's got In God We Trust printed on it, you, would be, you can just donate it to Fellowship of the Hills. <laughs> amen? Yeah, if you don't want it, we'll take it and we'll use it for God's glory. Amen? amen. So I thought about writing out there, writing a little news article that says, hey, listen, everything that's printed with In God We Trust, here you can just put it in the envelope and send it to us and we'll take care of it for you. You know, there's a lot of folks don't mind spending it, do they? They don't care what it says. But we have a rich heritage in God we trust. And yes, we do enjoy this holiday and this maybe a day off for many. But let's not forget that it came with a price. It came with a price for those to be able to celebrate what we're doing in worshiping our Lord. To be able to go out and celebrate in the freedom of having a good time. Worshiping our Lord, for me, is one of the greatest freedoms we could ever have. And if we're not careful, we'll take it for granted, and we could lose this freedom. I'm sure many of you are watching the political arena and what's taking place. If you would have told me that we would see things happening today in this country that are happening now, I would have said, you're crazy. Of course, then again, when the computer came out and I had to figure out how that thing worked, I never thought we'd be able to do that either, but, wow. So, what about in God we trust? Are we still a nation that trusts God, or have we drifted away? You know, they say that there are more Christians in America today than any other time in history. You say, well, Marty, that makes sense because of the population. Okay, well, I'll give you that. But the reality is, if there are more Christians in America today than there have ever been in history, why is it that there is the lack of influence by Christians in America that there ever has been in history? In fact, one biblical scholar, he said this. He said, today's churches are nothing more than religious social clubs with less spiritual impact on morality than there ever has been in history. 
Now think about that just for a moment. If there are more Christians in America than there ever has been, then how is it that our churches have less influence on the morality than there ever was? Well, we can say, you know, America has some problems. And you know what? I can stand here and I can agree with you on that this morning. We are facing an enemy today that is willing to die and to give the lives of their children for a false god. How do you defeat an enemy like that? We live in a country where right now the crime rate is worse than it has ever been in history. The murder rate in cities like Chicago and Dallas and Baltimore are at an all-time high. We live in a time where the respect of our law enforcement is at an all-time low. Where each and every day we hear of law enforcement officers being killed in the line of duty. We live in a time where our courts have become reality TV shows. More concerned about ratings than justice. As we think of history, I saw this caption not too long ago. We are a country that put a man on the moon, but yet we are a country right now that is trying to figure out whether we should put a man in the woman's restroom. And it may sound humorous to many of us, but it's a, it's a reality that we are facing today. How did this happen? We are living in a country today where the definition of marriage has been redefined. Yes, a decline, depravity, and we ask ourselves, is there hope? Is there really a hope for the nations? Is there really a hope for the United States to be that nation of hope to other nations? Is there really any hope for us as we sit in this building this morning in this house of God, in this sanctuary where we can come together and we can worship in freedom, can we say to ourselves, there's hope for tomorrow? Well, let me share something with you. I serve the same God of yesterday as I serve today who will be the same God tomorrow. So there is hope. And as you listen to this message this morning, my prayer is, is that God will speak to your heart. And that you won't leave this place today on this Memorial Day weekend and say, you know what, we just need to give up. You know, we're gonna just, just going to kind of cruise into what happens in this country, and we're not going to do anything about it. When you leave this place today, I want you to understand there's hope for America. And you know where it's going to start? It's going to start in this room. It's going to start in your life. It's going to start in this community, in your home. But the, uh, <laughs> as the lesson this morning, are you willing to get out of the boat? Are you willing to get out of your comfort zone? Oh, it's nice and comfortable in those chairs, isn't it? I've sat in them a couple of times. I like them. They're comfortable. I like being comfortable. I just wish they reclined. <laughs> you know? By the way, I need to warn you, um, from where I'm at up here from time to time, every now and then I scan the room. And uh, I see somebody. I have purchased a Nerf gun. You never know when it might come out. I remember when I was teaching classes to law enforcement, one of my favorite things to do is to find a student that was dozing off in class. And then I would ask him a question. <laughs> and they poked the guy next to him and said, what did he say? I got you all worried, don't I? <laughs> On the screen is Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Follow along as I read that, and I want you to notice a few things that are underlined. We're going to come to this passage in just a moment as I explain it to you. We're going to go to several places in God's Word as He gives us this message this morning. 
Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and this is what it says. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord. So Zerubbabel, <laughs> say that five times real quick. <laughs> Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, if you will, I want you to think for just a moment, to be a great leader, you have to be willing to understand that to be a good leader, you have to listen to those or put those in place that are really smarter than you. I tried to be one of those leaders when I was with the agency. As I progressed in the rank, I tried to surround myself by those that were more intelligent than me because I wanted to have wisdom to make the right decisions. The problem with that is, is you have to be comfortable in your skin. You guys know what I'm saying by that? You have to be comfortable and not worried about someone taking your job. You also have to be careful not to micromanage. And I, that's one of my faults. I have to be careful with that. I have to listen to other words of advice and then put it in a, in a bag and shake it up. So, okay, let's make the right decision. To be a good leader, you have to know that. You have to be humble. You have to be, be willing to listen to those that have more intelligence than you and realize that maybe your decision isn't the best decision whether it be for the agency, for the community, for your home, or for your country. How many of you are married this morning? All the guys are looking at their wife. We are today, right? Yeah, good. All right. <clears throat> How many of you have had to learn to compromise? Amen. Yeah. All the guys are saying amen. That's right. Yeah, compromise. <laughs> and then the four wives nudge you. What are you talking about compromise? You have no idea. You know? I'll just share something with you. Uh, I'll be leaving this afternoon, headed to Fort Lauderdale. I've been without Susan for three weeks. And um, guys, where you at? Y'all do this? Uh, you see, on the bed, I just turn one side over. I sleep on that side when I'm done. I turn that side right back. No need to mess up the whole bed. And I thought to myself, you know what? Susan's been gone for three weeks. <laughs> he said, Marty, you slept in the same sheets for three weeks? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I take a shower before I go to bed. All right. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. I wanted Susan to come home to a clean house. And I've been doing a lot of work in this house. And... Uh, so I thought last night, I said, my goodness, I need to wash the sheets or put on a new set. I said, well, I'm not going to put on a new set. I just wash these and put these back on. No sense in pulling something else, else out and unfolding it. So, but I thought to myself, well, you know, that's not really cool because one side's clean. <laughs> no, no. I took them off and washed them. So, but anyway, I've been without Susan for three weeks. And uh, by the way, praise God, her sister came home from the hospital this past Friday. Praise God, all the tubes are out, and we're excited about that. The infection's under control. Yes, praise God. Uh, poor Susan, she's had, a, she's had an incredible time, um, you know, with everything that's been going on down there. Poor thing, she not only got her sister home and her mom, and then she's, had her, she's got her mom's car, and she went out to get some food and some other things, and uh, while she was sitting at a traffic light, she got rear-ended. So, but she's okay. She's all right. Her mom's car doesn't look too good, but everything's fine down there as well. So it's been an incredible weekend for her. She's actually looking forward to me getting down there, and I'm looking forward to seeing her again, and we'll get to see our grandson graduate here in, in another week. So pray for us uh, in the next two weeks. And Jeff, by the way, just to add, he'll be preaching next Sunday. But the reality is this, that we, we've had to learn to compromise through the course of our marriage. Make some adjustments. And to be a good leader, you have to be willing to compromise, but compromise on the right principles. And notice this in the scripture here. It says that we go by the Spirit of the Lord. We understand that it's not by our might, not by our power, but it's through the Spirit of God and how we operate. Now I want you to, if you would, go to Isaiah. And I want you to see an incredible, awesome leader here in Isaiah chapter 11. Actually, it's the prophecy, prophecy of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read to you from verses 2 through 5. And it says this, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide the fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And righteousness will be the belt around his loins. And faithfulness, the belt of his waist. This is the prophecy of Jesus Christ. But I want to share with you as well, wouldn't it be great if we had this kind of leader today? Amen? 
So let me ask you a question, church. Why aren't we praying for that kind of leader? Not just a national leader, but also for our civic leaders and also for our church leaders and also for the leaders within our home. Why aren't we praying for those kind of leaders? I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, you don't have to turn there. He's talking about the armor of God. And one of the things Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, he says, we wear the helmet of salvation. He's speaking to us as Christians. And he says, not only do we wear the helmet of salvation, but we go with the sword of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. What is the Spirit of the Lord, the sword of the Lord? We go with what? Truth. You see, this is, this is it right here. This is truth. This is how we live our life. This is how we prayerfully want our country to be, a country of truth. But how will they know unless we share it with them and tell them? Well, as I continue to think about this and ponder this verse, I thought to myself, okay, by the Spirit. I want you to underline that in, in, in your scripture this morning. By my spirit. And I thought about what's been taking place in our country throughout history, but more so I thought about what's taking place in the churches. And I thought about that quote that says, well, you know, we have more Christians now than we've ever had before, but yet we have less influence, less impact on our nation and the world. And I thought, well, why is that? And then it, then it hit me. We're looking at everything to solve problems and we have excluded the Spirit of the Lord. Are you with me, church? Now, let me see if I can explain that. Let me tell you where we have failed. We have looked for movements to change our country. How many of you remember, and I, I grew up in the era of the 60s, all the movements that took place in the 60s. And, and sadly, then listen, there's nothing wrong with evangelism, there's nothing wrong with, with, with revivals, but we have looked at mass evangelistic opportunities, mass revivals to change the country. Now, as, as true as that can be, because we believe that as you change a life in Jesus Christ, there, therefore it will change a country. But the reality is, if we're dependent upon events and movements to change a country, we, we fail. We can go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ all we want to, but unless the lives that are changed are willing to be an influence in the country, we fail. Would you not agree with me, church? Amen. So we've looked at movements. In fact, I, th I thought of this. There has been a million-man march for just about everything under the sun. I wonder if there's ever been a million-man march for Jesus Christ where we're going to go out and change the world through him. Well, the slogan of Make America Great Again. I actually like that slogan, Make America Great Again. But it's not going to happen by doing this. You know how it's going to happen? By doing that. By applying the Spirit of God. You see, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way as it relates to man trying to do it his way. Man puffing up his shirt and his, and his chest and saying, you know what? We're going to do it this way and we're going we're gonna to just conquer the world. God says, no, not unless you're willing to humble yourself and seek my face. In fact, we'll see that verse in just a moment in 2 Chronicles. Not until you're willing to allow God to do his thing. And in order for you to do that, you've got to be willing to let go of your thing. You've got to realize that you can't do it under your power and your might. In fact, let me take you someplace else. Go to Deuteronomy. I want you to see something here. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Verses 5 and 6. Now, this is kind of interesting because we have to be reminded of the power of God. In fact, part of the Sunday school lesson this morning, Francis Chan was teaching a part of the class in Psalm chapter 23 for the lesson this morning. And, the, and understanding the power of God. And sometimes we have to be reminded of what God can do. And in order for us to be reminded of what God can do, we have to realize what God has done. Are you with me, church? Now, I want you to notice here, the Israelites were in a time, they were kind of floundering out there around Moab, and, and, and they're facing wars, and there's a generation that's changing. There are children that are coming on board, so to speak, that did not witness the deliverance of their people from Egypt, the bondage of Egypt. They, they did not witness the Red Sea parting. They did not witness all these amazing miracles that God did in getting them to where they're at today. So Moses here in Deuteronomy 
chapter 20, is explaining this to them. Now, I want to just read verse number one. I want you to notice this, and I want to see if you can make this applicable in your life. When you go, now I just want you to put the you, take that and put your name in there. When Marty goes, when Bill goes, when Bob goes, listen to this. And this is Moses talking to the people. He says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you. Now, let me ask you, let's just pause here for a moment. If we think about where we're at today, how many of us see, there's, it seems like there's more of them than there is of us? It seems pretty scary, doesn't it? You see, that's what the Israelites were facing. They were facing armies that were much more powerful, much more larger, much more weaponized than they are. And Moses was trying to remind the people, he said, wait a minute, I, I, I'm going to take you to some history here and show you where God has brought you and how you've gotten here. But he starts off by saying, when you look like you're going to face someone that's bigger, tougher, and stronger than you, look what he says. He says, when the horses and the chariots and people are more numerous than you, what's he say, church? Look at the next line. What's he say? Yeah, don't be afraid. No, what's he say? Come on. Don't be afraid. Come on, how many chickens I got in here? Come on, be honest with me. How many of you admit you're a chicken? Okay, there's a few of you. I love honesty in the church. It's an amazing thing when it happens in the house of God. The people are honest, yeah. Come on. Do you all have fears? Listen, as I get older, I, I could climb up a ladder, and it didn't bother me a bit. I was changing light bulbs this week. And I, and I know I shouldn't have done it, but I got on the very last rung. And I, I, felt, I was like, whoa, dude, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, and I was reaching up trying to change the ball. And I, then, then it hit me. What if I fall? I don't have that little button to press, you know? Uh, what do I do? I mean, Susan's not there. I don't know who I'm going to call. I mean, what do you do? So I, I became afraid. I got back down off the ladder and said, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> that was pretty dumb. And then I moved a couple of uh, shelves down from upstairs. And after I did the first one, I said, boy, that was really dumb. I almost fell down the stairs carrying this shelf. Um, as much as I like to think I'm the man I used to be, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. So I called Mickey. I said, Mickey, come help me move this shelf. So he came and helped me move his shelf. But you know what? We all have things and, and fears, don't we? And many of us today are maybe saying, you know what? I fear what's happening to our country, so what do we do? Because it looks bigger and larger than us, we just go curl up in a ball and say, it is what it is, and what's going to happen is going to happen. Look what he says. He goes on and he says, don't be afraid. For the Lord your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt, what's he say, church? Is with you. If we can understand as we leave this house today that no matter what we face as a follower of Jesus Christ, no matter how big and how tough the enemy is, God's with me. I mean, good night. We can go through all of those Sunday school lessons, those things we learned. Francis brought a few of them up today in this class. I mean, I look back at King David. He at one time was a little boy who faced Goliath, bigger, tougher, stronger than he was. The whole army of Israel was scared, was afraid of them. Those Philistine people are huge. If they're anything like Goliath, we just need to, we need to regroup and figure out what we're going to do. And there was a little boy, David. What did he say when he faced Goliath? Do you remember what he said with a quote that he made to Goliath? What did he say? God is with me. God's with me. He wasn't afraid of Goliath. Why wasn't he afraid? Because God was with him. Can you imagine if every Christian who claims Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if we are a as large of a group in this country as it is reported, but as we all know that many people for profess to be a Christian, but they have no idea what the word even means. But let's just say that if we are the big force of those that believe in Jesus Christ, can you imagine if we walked out of our churches today and we said, hey, listen, God is with us. We'll not fear. We'll face the challenges of today and tomorrow without fear. Look what Moses says. He goes on. Let's drop down to verse number five. It says, the officers also shall speak to the people, saying, now I want you to underline every time you see this next phrase, who is the man. And I want you to take out who is the man and say, put your name there. Who is Marty? Who is Bill? Who is Joan? Who is Linda? Put, put all those names in there, okay? He goes on, he says, The officer shall speak to the people, saying, Who is the man 
that has built a new house and has not dedicated it. Let him depart and return to his house. Otherwise, he might die in the battle and another man would dedicate it. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and ask yourself about your home. Where's Adam? Adam's here. Adam just had a brand new baby boy, Arlo. Cool name. We notice Adam is taking a break today. <laughs> and Adam, I'm going to use you as an illustration. Four children. God has truly blessed you. Praise God for that. Now, I know Adam, and I know that Jesus Christ is not only a part of Adam's life, but also Adam and Casey bring Jesus Christ into their home. Their home is dedicated to Jesus Christ. Their children, in fact, I remember it wasn't too long ago, we had Adrenelle up here and dedicated her to Jesus Christ. We said that we're going to be the parents. You said you're going to be the parents. They're going to lead Adrenelle to Jesus Christ. Now, this is what Moses is saying here. He says, if, if you are that person that hasn't dedicated your home to God, you better get home right now and do it because somebody's going to come in and take it. Now, are you listening to me, church? I hear parents say to me all the time, why is it that my children are the way they are? Why is it they're acting the way they are? Well, did you ever stop to think that maybe you should have had them in the house of God? Did you ever think that maybe you should have taught them about Jesus Christ? Did you ever think that you should have taught them about morality and integrity? Because I will promise you, if you don't, somebody else is going to teach them something else. They're going to take them down a path you don't want them to go to. So Moses says, hey, listen, before you go and face the battle, before you go and face your enemies, you better make sure your house is in order. Look what else he says, verse number 6. Who is the man? Again, put your name there. Who is the man that has planted a vineyard and has not begun to use its fruits? Let him depart and return to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle, and another man would begin to use his fruits. The workplace. What God has blessed you with. Have you dedicated that to the Lord? Have you given that to God? Say, so God, whatever you have given me, whatever you've blessed me with, wherever it is you would have me to work, wherever I put my feet, use me. I dedicate that all to you, Lord. Many folks are wondering why their job's just a mess, why they hate what they do, that they get up every morning and it was just, oh, such a bore. Complain about what's happening. I've got to be honest with you, I've met some folks in the last several weeks that have come and done some things for me and some folks that I have called to come and do some things for me from, from other establishments around this area and, and, and other areas, and they hate their job. I, I couldn't imagine getting up every day and hate my job. I loved what I did. I enjoyed it. I was thankful for it. Moses tells people, hey, listen, whatever you touch, whatever you're doing, if, if you go out and plant your vineyard, better dedicate it to the Lord because someone else is going to come in and take it from you. Look at verse number 7. He says, and who is the man engaged to a woman and has not married her? Let him depart and return to his house. Otherwise, he might die in the battle and another man would marry her. You know what I wrote in, my, in, in the little highlights of my Bible there? Treat Susan right. Are you with me? Treat Susan right. Don't take her for, trust me, after three weeks, I have learned not to take Susan for granted. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, she, uh, she is, uh, her mom is, I was telling somebody, uh, somebody last night that Susan's mom is an incredible cook. In fact, that's one of the things I look forward to about going down there. Just an awesome cook. And that's where Susan learned to do it. Susan, Susan's a great cook. But so, so all these last three weeks, Susan has been telling me about the various things that she's been eating. And I finally had to tell her after about the second week, I said, honey, we need to stop this conversation. <laughs> I said, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, by the way, I don't know if you guys know, every Wednesday night at Cook's, all you can eat spaghetti. Uh, I can tell you every place to go and where to eat at certain, certain days. I have tried the, uh, the hot dog at uh, Burger King. It's very good. You can only eat so many hamburgers, and you've got to venture out. Nachos and chicken wings and all those different things. I want to thank those for, for having... Linda had me over for dinner the other night and fixed me my favorite meal. She didn't know this. Cube steaks and gravy. Awesome. Awesome. And, and I, I looked, and I, and I ate the other one, a second one. No, she didn't make peas. She knew better than that. But you know what, men? Don't take, take advantage. 
of that lovely lady God's blessed you with. And let me flip the other side of the coin to that. Ladies, don't take advantage of your man. God has put the two of you together for a reason. Some of you are still trying to figure it out, I know. <laughs> but you know what? You know, and, and, and look, Moses is going all the way down the list, and he's saying, hey, listen, if you don't dedicate this to God, someone's going to take it from you. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, if you, if you don't put her on the pedestal she needs to be on, somebody else will try to do it and take her from you. Look at here. He goes on in verse number 9. He said, It shall come about that when the officers have finished speaking to the people, they shall appoint commanders of armies at the head of the people. When they approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. It shall come about, if it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then it shall be that all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. You know what God was telling them? God was saying, listen, if you follow all of this, you follow this recipe, you follow this blueprint that I have for you, you are going to win, and it will be successful. So if we want to know what the recipe is on how to win and do what God wants us to do, then what will we do? We will follow the blueprint, the recipe that he has for our life, for our home, and for our country. So I gave you those, that small list of all those things that we've tried to do in our power and in our might, and they've been failures. So can I give you a laundry list of those things that will work? Number one, if you want to write these down, feel free to do that. Number one, we need to be prayer warriors and biblically sound. Prayer warriors and biblically sound. What does that mean? That means that we need to talk to God and we need to listen to Him. Now, I'll be driving here in a, in a couple hours and headed to Fort Lauderdale. It's about a 13 hour ride for me, me and my little dog Taffy. Yeah. And I'll be talking to the Lord on that journey. I do. I spend a lot of time. When people drive by, I just pretend I got a cell phone and God's <laughs> chatting here. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> But I'll have a conversation with God. We'll talk about today's message. I love talking to him. He said, Marty, does he talk back all the time? It's amazing. In fact, sometimes I have to pay attention to the road because he's talking so much. Now, how does he talk to you? He speaks through the Holy Spirit to me. He brings a peace. And he'll say, you know what, Marty? Hey, listen, message was great because you delivered what I wanted you to deliver. I said, well, Lord, do you think they got it? He says, don't worry about it. I got it. I'll share it with them. It was my message. Thank you for setting the table. It was my meat. So he wants us to commune with him. He wants us to be. Why is it that we only pray when we have a crisis in our life? You ever thought about that? Now, we have praise and prayer tonight. We won't because obviously there's so many that are out of town. So I encourage you to take time in your home. Take time with your family and spend, some, spend a season of prayer. And I hope you're already doing that. But when I come to praise and prayer, it's an amazing thing to me. We go around the room, and, and, and of course, we have praise time. But it's amazing that the time is, is saturated by so many prayer requests, so many things going on in the lives of others, so many crises. Folks that are going through physical situations in their life, folks that are going through financial situations, folks that are having difficulties in relationships and in their marriage and in their home and at their workplace crisis after crisis and God wants us to bring those burdens in fact he tells us in his word to to put all of our burdens at the foot of the cross to cast all of our cares on him but you know what God wants us to talk to him all the time not just in a time of crisis and then he wants us to walk with him don't you love that song and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me. you all know that song yeah we sing these songs, and, but we really don't pay attention to what they say. If he is walking with us, are we in his word? Now, again, I'm not going to go back because it's been almost six months ago starting next week. And I, my challenge to you was to get into God's word and to read it through this year. I wonder how many have slipped to the wayside. I wonder how many are saying, you know what, Pastor? Well, I was really, man, I was gung-ho that first couple of weeks, and then, uh, wow, things just got in the way. Some of you are going to go home today and go, oh, man, he was talking to me. Dude, i got to get the Bible out tomorrow and read it. <laughs> get the dust off, yeah. Hey, listen, if you want to see your home change, your life change, the world change, this country change, we have to be willing to spend time communing with God, and we need to spend time in his word so we'll have the knowledge of what the 
truth is. If we have the knowledge of what the truth is, when error comes in, it, in our pathway, we know that we can stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, that's not what God's Word says. Hey, wait a minute, hold on here. Uh, God says that marriage is about a man and a woman. Hey, wait a minute, God says that we shouldn't abort children at a rate that we are doing that today. Isn't it amazing? I'm sorry, I've got to pause here for a moment. Isn't it amazing that we are more worried about saving a whale than the life of an unborn child? Amen. How is that possible? How is it possible that organizations like PETA will take the time to save? Now listen, I love animals. Don't get me wrong. Please, don't go leave this place. They say, Marty hates animals. No, I love animals. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you what. I was created in God's image. Amen. And if I'm created in God's image, that means I am a precious soul to him. Just my thought. So why is it that we have allowed this stuff to happen? If we are a Christian nation, if we are a nation that says, I still trust in God, well, it's because we haven't been sharing the truth. We've sat in our chairs because it's comfortable to be there. Which takes us to number two. We need to be active in our community. And there's a way to be active in our community and show the love of Christ. Number one, we need to be active by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing the truth. When we th see things that are a lie, things that are not truth, we need to speak them out and do them in a proper way. We're to raise our children. Number three, raise our children in God's way and God's principles. I've already mentioned that a moment ago, the importance of making sure these little ones are grounded in God's Word. Because if they're not grounded, they will be susceptible to the lies of the world and its influences. Number four, I said that we're to reach the lost for Jesus Christ if we reach one person for Jesus Christ, that's one more that can help in changing and influencing the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will promise you this. There is a false religion out there right now that is tapping into the minds of young men and women and getting them to sacrifice their very life for a perverted religion. I ask myself, how is, Lord, how is that possible? How is it possible that we as the followers of Jesus Christ have sat idly by, and here comes this one, this false religion, these false perverted religions, and they've been able to indoctrinate people that they would be willing to strap a bomb on themselves and take the lives of innocent people. How did that happen? And it hit me. Because my people are sitting in their seats, coming to their social clubs, Sunday after Sunday, and not sharing the truth. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And last but certainly not least, and that's to support not only God's church, but Christian organizations that are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just this past week, I met with one of our young ladies that works over the Women's Enrichment Center. We support financially and prayerfully the Women's Enrichment Center. What do they do? They speak to these young women that come in and, and, and they're making a decision on what to do with their child. Some are embarrassed because they've gotten pregnant and they feel that they're going to dishonor their home or their family. And these ladies sit down with them and show them the love of Christ and say, hey, listen, God still loves you. God don't make no junk. We all fail. We all have mistakes in our life. God forgives us of those if we give it to him. If we take it to the cross, he'll forgive us. But remember, God's got a gift right here. Don't take the life of this child. So... Not only do we support the church in getting the gospel of Jesus Christ up, but we support organizations who preach and teach the truth of God's Word. You see, I believe there's hope for America. But again, it starts... Turn with me to 2 Chronicles as we bring this message to a close. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You know this verse. It's been quoted. In fact, it's quoted every 4th of July, every Memorial Day in churches across America. In fact, it's, it was quoted just the other night a few weeks ago as we were at the National Day of Prayer. In fact, so many times this verse gets quoted that it actually loses its meaning. 
So if you'll allow me this morning as I wrap up this message God has for us, as we've talked about leaders, as we've talked about uh, men and women of integrity, as we've talked about the blueprint that God has for us to putting Him first in our life, to carry the sword of the Spirit of God, His truth, to make a difference. Let's take this verse and let's look at it, and as we leave this place today, let's make it applicable in our life. First and foremost, I want you to notice this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, we just read the verse, but let's dissect it real quickly, and let's see what it actually truly means to each and every one of us. If my people... Now I want you to look at the person next to you. I want that person to look at you. And then I want you to look at yourself. And I want you to ask yourself, are you one of those people? Are you one of God's people? You see, God says, if my people. So let's just pause for a moment. Let's say, okay, if fellowship of the hills. You say, well, Marty, can we make a difference? Well, let me tell you something. We've already made a difference. Isn't it amazing when we have two sheriffs that'll say, hey, listen, we want to put in God we trust on our patrol car. One of them, not even from this county. We made a difference. One of the things that I'm very excited about and very thankful for is every time that we have ever done any event, any function to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out there, we have never charged a dime, and we will never charge a dime. God will take care of it in His way. As you know, we don't pass an offering plate. Here those two little things sit back there in the back, and God's provided for the ministry of this church and for the missionaries and those organizations that we support to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. No man should ever have to stand in a pulpit and beg for God's money. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he takes care of his people. My responsibility is to get up here and preach the truth and let the truth do its work. So he says, if my people. So if fellowship of the hills, who is called by whose name? called by the name of Jesus Christ. We proclaim him as our Lord and our Savior. So if we, his people, are called by, my, by his name, we'll humble ourselves. What does that mean? Realize that we can't do it on our own. Anytime that we ever do anything in this church, we bathe it in prayer. We bathe it in prayer. Lord, it, Lord, we want this to be about you. We want you to be honored and glorified in here. Lord, when we, when we go out and we take these orange buckets like we did last year and give food out, Lord, may that touch the heart of someone. May it not, be, not, may it not, Lord, be to puff us up. But, Lord, may it be to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ because we met a personal need in someone's life. So, Lord, may we be humble in all that we do. So the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So first and foremost, we need to come to the Lord with a humble heart and realize that, going back to Zechariah, not by my power, not by my strength, not by my might, so I come to the Lord humble. Then it says pray. Do you remember that recipe? Pray. Commune with God. Talk to God. And then what else does it say? Seek his face. Well, how do I do that? God's word. I seek his face. I seek what he wants in my life. What he wants for our nation, for our country. It's all right here. What he wants for me at work. What he wants for me in my marriage. For how to raise my children. How I serve in his church. If I'll humble myself and I pray and then I seek his face. And look at the last part here. Think something that I have to do. I have to turn from my wicked ways. How many of you have this little box? Well, it's time to be honest again. Okay? How many of you have this little box that's all yours? You've given God everything else, but you got this one little box. You know what I'm saying? It's that one little thing that you really like that you want to do. Nobody else probably knows about it. It's kind of like your little hidden secret. You know what God's saying? He says, turn from that. He says, I don't want all but. God says, I want it all. So when we're willing to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from, it's all right, Lord, i got this little thing going on in my life, and I really want you to bless me. I really want you to use me, but I've got to let this go. I've, I've, I've got to turn from this. And God says, yeah, now's the time. Get rid of it. Let it go. And watch the amazing things I want to do in your life. So, turn from our wicked ways. Then notice what he says. He says, then I'm going to hear from heaven. He says, I'm going to hear you. What else does he say? This is God doing this. He says, I'm going to forgive you. You know what? There is nothing you've done that God can't forgive. Nothing. The only thing that God can't forgive is you turning your back on him. You don't ever want to go to eternity and say, well, you know, Jesus, I could have accepted you as Lord and Savior, but I don't believe all that stuff. You know what he said? Okay, face the justice. Forgiveness. 
God will forgive sin if we bring it to him. Every Sunday morning, I stand in there with the deacons before I come out here. And my prayer before I walk to this pulpit, this sacred place, to deliver his message, is I make sure my heart is clean. How many of you have ever done something, and all of a sudden, like two days later, you go, oops. Not that someone reminded you of it, but the Holy Spirit reminded you of it. That ever happened to you? Or am I the only one that happens to? It's like two or three days later, it's like, oh man. Wow, that was bad. I should have, Lord, I'm sorry. And he says, I know, I, I've already forgiven you at the cross, but I wanted you to ask for my forgiveness on this. So before I come out here, say, Lord, if there's anything in my heart that would cause, cause any part of your message to be hindered, forgive me. Let my mind be in tune with what it is you would. And, and Lord, at the same time, Lord, if you, if you want to change your message, it's yours. Change it. And by the way, he's already done that several times today. <laughs> Forgiveness. Then this part right here. He says, heal. I'll heal your land. Now I want to ask you this simple question. How many of you want to see America healed? So where does it start? Where does it start? Right here. Right here. So, Marty, what can I do? Well, <laughs> can I take you back to King David? That little boy named David who later became the king of Israel? That little boy named David stood against a giant when the rest of the soldiers were scared to death. That little boy, in the power and the name of God, defeated a giant. So, you want to know what you can do? You could be a David. You can be the one that defeats the giants along the way each and every day. It can start with you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and we just go around the room. God's people willing to humble themselves, willing to seek his face and pray, willing to turn from the mess in their life and say, God, use me in an incredible and awesome way. And God said, I'll hear. I'll hear your, hear your pleas. And I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to heal your land. That's my prayer. And not, listen, I want him to heal my home. I want him to heal relationships. It's not just about a country. It's about everything in life. Some of you today are facing some things at home. Some relationships. Some other situations in your life. And you want those things healed. That's the recipe right there. But as we think of Memorial Day weekend, I truly believe that there is a revival that's going to take place in America before Jesus Christ returns again. I believe that. And, and my prayer, my prayer is that he lets me experience that. I want to see America turn back to God. I don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, but I want to see it happen. Not because some politician got up and said, make America great. And again, I love that slogan. But I want America to be great because we humbled ourselves and God did it. Because his people got out of their chairs and said, we're going to march for Jesus Christ. We're going to live for him. And America will be great again. Go with me to prayer. Father, I thank you for how this message has touched my heart. Lord, each and every day, my prayer is, is that, as Paul said, that you'll make me more like you. Lord, you continue to use that chisel as you mold me and make me into what you want me to be. Each and every day, Lord, there's a learning experience and a learning curve. Lord, may I never give up. May I never quit. May I never throw in the towel. Lord, I want to be the warrior like Paul. I want to be that one who stays in the race, doesn't clog up the track, doesn't get on the sidelines. I want to continue in the race. And Father, I want one day, as your servant, for you to say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Father, I pray for each and every person in this room who claims you as their Lord and their Savior, that, Father, that they will take this day, make this a new day in their life, that, Father, they'll humbly realize and, and understand and give themselves to you totally, not holding on to little boxes. They'll seek your face in all that they do, and Father, I pray that you'll make them champions like David. 
Make them great warriors in the name of Christ. Give them the right words to say at the right time. I thank you, Father, for one of our members this morning who came with me and shared with me that, that Father, just this past week, they stepped out of their comfort zone. And they had asked to, to pray with someone. And they got a chance to pray. And, and how exhilarating it was to know that they had stepped from that comfort zone and followed your lead. Lord, that's just refreshing for me to hear that. And there's many others in this room that are following you, Lord, that are just, just sitting in the seats. Oh, Lord, may they obey your call. And Father, for those in this room who say, you know what, Pastor, I, I, man, I've been listening to this message this morning, and, and I'm one of those, I can talk about Jesus, I know who he is, I know who God is, but I've never accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I've been walking around living a lie. Or maybe you're that person that came in here this morning and you just said, hey, you know, I just want to test the waters and see what this Jesus thing really is all about. And that's me. I'm missing something and I want him in my life. Well, my friend, right where you're at, the Word of God says that if we come before him and admit that we cannot save ourselves, it goes back to that verse I just read, it's not by our power, not by our might, but only through Jesus Christ. Admit that Jesus is the only one that can save us. Admit that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and accept that payment. The Word of God says that if we come before Him, very simple words, but we believe it in our heart, the key words to believe. So Jesus, I come to you now and I confess my sin before you, realizing and understanding that I cannot save myself. And Jesus, I accept the payment that you paid for me on the cross of Calvary. You shed your precious blood for me, Lord, and and Lord, I accept that payment. Jesus, three days later, you walked out of the tomb to prove that you could conquer sin, you could conquer death, and that you are God. So Jesus, I accept your payment for my sin. I've confessed it before you. I accept your forgiveness and your payment. And Jesus, I make you Lord of my life from this moment on. Jesus, do with me what you will. And Jesus, thank you for that gift of eternal life. Thank you, Father, for the blessings of what will follow as you lead me in your path. The Word of God says at that very moment that we accept the forgiveness, the salvation that Jesus freely offers to us through the cross. And at that very moment, we become a child of the King, never to be plucked out of the hands of God. Our name written permanently down in the Lamb's Book of Life with the gift of eternal life. Today, if that was you, my friend, at the end of the service, I want you to come to me. I want you to say, Pastor, today I made Jesus real in my life. I want to hug you and share some more things with you. Maybe today you'll say, Pastor, you know what? I've been sitting on the sidelines. Not anymore. I want to see America successful in Jesus Christ again. I want to see us to be a nation that still is and still does trust in God. Pastor, today I'm going to pray and I'm going to seek God's face I'm going to make a difference in my home and in my workplace and make a difference here in serving him. Let me know that. I want to rejoice with you. I want to pray for you. Father, again, I want to thank you as we close this service. I can't say it enough. I want to thank you for the men and women. Father, who gave of their lives for our freedom. Thank you for the freedom that we had this morning to be where we're at to love on you and to worship you. I pray, Father, for our comrades across the world who don't have this freedom, that are secretly meeting in dark rooms. Father, many of them don't even have a full Bible. They just cherish a page or a verse. So much of it we have taken for granted. Father, I pray for them. Pray your protection over them. And Father, again, I just close and thank you for what you're going to do in the life of your church. And Father, I pray that you give me the blessing and the opportunity to see a revival in our nation where we can say we still trust in God. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen and amen.